All right, today we are starting a new class. The class is, why do we do what we do in worship? That's it. Matt Fish asked me to teach this class, and so I thought I'd comply for once and uh, teach this class. So we're going to have a class on worship. I don't know how many weeks it will be, probably at least four weeks, but I haven't mapped out the whole thing at this point. So, the worship of the Lord, that's what we, we will focus on. Let's uh, open our class with prayer. Our Father, we glorify your name. Father, we love you. You are perfect in every way. You are perfect in all your attributes. Uh, Father, we, um, we are grateful that you have loved us and that your Son died for us, to redeem us from our misery and our sin. And so, Father, I pray as we uh, study worship that it would help us to be better worshipers of you, all to the praise and glory of your Son and the power of your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so big, broad question here. Why do we worship God? Why do you worship God? Why are you here this Lord's Day morning to worship God? That's my question, Just and I want answers. Throw things out just to get us thinking about worship and why we're here. It's always good because we get in routines, don't we? We get in ruts. We we just go through the motions at points in our lives, and our flesh sort of dulls us, and we have to be reminded of even the, just the basic things and why we do them. So why do we worship God? For salvation, he is to honor and glorify his name. It's commanded by God. It's why we were created. So they're all good answers. To enjoy Him forever. We were made to worship Him. What did you say? Did you? Okay, He's God. We are children of God. He loves us. We love Him in return. Because it glorifies Him. Worship glorifies Him. Yes, these are all good and very sophisticated answers that you have given. Um, <clears throat> the scriptures say that he is worthy to be honored, right? Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. That's 1 Chronicles 16, 28 and 29. So worship is ascribing to God the glory that he has in and of himself. And so the reason we worship is God is worthy to be worshipped. The reason we worship is because he, he is so glorious. He is so perfect in every way that the only proper response to that glory is worship, bowing down before him and ascribing to him the glory that is due to his name. So that is why you're here today. You're here today because in God's providence and in his mercy, he opened up your eyes to his glory. Otherwise, you would go worship sports, you would go worship artwork, you would go worship trees and stars and the moon. You would not worship this God whom you've never seen, but your eye, the eyes of your faith have seen him, right? The eyes of your faith have seen him, and so you know that, that he is worthy of this praise. And so In worship, we're just ascribing to God the glory that's due His name. That's why we do it. So that's 
that's first base level. But the, the question is, why do we do what we do in worship? Why do we have the liturgy? Why do we, um, why do we have the certain parts? And so I'll start with um, the age-old distinction between the regulative principle and the, just to get this out of the way, the regulative principle and the normative principle of worship. Anybody want to take a stab at what's different between the regulative principle of worship and the normative principle of worship? Chirp, 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 chirp. If it wasn't smoke and it was a cloud, would you be okay with it? Because the temple was filled with a cloud. That's almost a serious answer. Okay. We're getting there, yeah. Yeah, uh, Chuck, you want to take a stab at it? <laughs> exactly. You taught this section of the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, basically, I'll make it even simpler. You need a positive command in Scripture for everything you do in worship. You need a positive command or a, a very clear deduction that you can make from Scripture. But it has, there has to be positive command for what we do in worship. The normative principle is you can do everything unless it's forbidden, right? Unless it says no. And so if it, if it doesn't speak to an issue, then you sort of have freedom to do that. That's not the regulative principle. The regulative principle is we need a positive command from Scripture to do what we do in worship. And that was, that was the um, early Reformed reaction to the Catholic Mass. Okay, And that was, I mean, but the principle of it is sola scriptura, right? We get our doctrine, we get um, our faith, we get what we know about God from Scripture alone, no other sources. And so that means our worship ought to be done from that source as well. So positive commands from Scripture are required for what we do in worship. So that's the broad answer of why we do what we do in worship. We do things that are commanded in Scripture. And we don't do things that are forbidden in Scripture. Right? And so that, that at the base level, that foundational level informs us. But let's go back, let's step back into 1555. Let's say you walk into uh, the Notre Dame in Paris. You walk into that cathedral. There's a roof at that time. Um, they're working on it now. I guess it's up. I don't know how far they've gotten back in re completing that wooden roof. But um, let's say you, you walk into a Roman Catholic cathedral. Um, before you walk through the doors of the cathedral, you're smacked in the face by the architecture. Flying buttresses, right? Angels, gargoyles, saints, images of God, pictures of Christ. I mean, it's all just in the architecture, okay? Okay. Already, we've departed from the regulative principle of worship. Already, we're making images of God, which are forbidden in Scripture. And stained glass windows, right, which tell maybe the, 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 tw the steps of the cross or uh, picture the apostles or the prophets of the Old Testament, all in stained glass. And then you walk through the tall, those tall front doors and you gaze at the amazingly tall ceilings. Um, and you see crucifixes all over the place around you. You see, and the difference between a cross and a crucifix, a crucifix has Jesus hanging, bleeding on the cross. It depicts the unresurrected Christ, 
right? Just the dead Christ dying on the cross, bleeding. And then um, a cross would just be a cross, an empty cross. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to answer that. It's too much of a distraction. I got to keep going. I'll. I'll come. But we're going to have a Q and A at the end, like we did with the last series. So, save that up and submit it. Okay. Um, there are ornate carvings of men and angels. There are crucifixes. There. Are, um, Biblical scenes depicted uh, not just on the stained glass, but in the, the stages of the cross around and leading up to the altar. This was worship in the Roman Catholic Church in, in the medieval era, up and through the Reformation. It was slightly tweaked in 1570 with the Council of Trent but um, it would, would be very much the same. But all of this, you notice, is a feast for the eyes. It's all about the eyes. It's about what you can see, what you can take in through that sense, the eyes. Um, there are candles. There are statues to saints, not just biblical characters. There are relics to be venerated, right? There's Mary and images and um, statues of Mary in which there are candles burning. You see the priest, and the priest is wearing luxurious outer garments, the chasuble, covered in embroidery along with their stoles, which announce something. Those stoles announce that they have sacerdotal status, that they can do the work of transforming that body and that blood into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. They have sacerdotal status. They, um, they can perform the ceremony. Then after all of that, you observe the liturgy of the high mass. And here's, here's how one man in uh, his book on liturgy describes the Mass. What is the Mass? In the Middle Ages, three conceptions attained prominence. One, the Mass was an epiphany of God amongst men, which focused attention upon the reality of the Eucharistic presence, upon the consecration at which it occurred, and upon the priest by whose action it was affected. Okay, so it was an epiphany of God. God was saying, look at the priest, look at the bread, and the consecration of it, and um, look at the Eucharist. Second, he says, the Mass as a sacrifice offered unto God for the benefit of the living and the dead. So the Mass was a, a work by which you could accrue merit, and that merit would go to either the living or the dead. So that's the way, that was the money-making machine of the medieval church. Okay? That is how the Vatican was built and built on the, um, the lies they told generations of people that they could save their loved ones and remove them from purgatory by giving them money which was the cost of a mass, and the mass would be said to get that person to move up a few notches. Third, the mass was an allegorical drama of the whole economy of redemption. It was an allegory acted up front. It was a spectacle to be observed. It was a dramatic play. You weren't to participate in it, but you were to observe it. Okay? And so, here's the liturgy of the High Mass. And I'm just going to describe certain sections of it because it's very long and very complicated. Okay? 
It would start with an introit and a curie eleison, ninefold, so nine curie eleisons sung by the choir. Then the ministers would enter. There would be a private preparation of those ministers, and all of this is taking place behind what's called a, a rood screen. A rood screen was probably about from, from here up to here, just a, a, a wall with slight gaps in it throughout. All of this liturgy takes place behind that. And, and it's for dramatic effect because what did, what did the priest have to do when he consecrated the bread? He had to lift that bread up and they, that would be basically all that they would see because of this rood screen. They would just see general motion, but as soon as the, the, um, the, the consecration happened, the bread was lifted up and they would gaze on that. And most people during the medieval time thought that that was all they had to be there for. That moment of the bread being visible because it was the body of Christ. So they said, right? So let me keep going. So the ministers enter, and it's all hidden, private. It's behind this rude screen. You see a little bit of motion, but not much going on. And then they say a bunch of things secretly. They whisper these things under their breath. That can't be heard by the congregation. There's an invocation in nomine patris. There's, um, I will go to the altar of the Lord from the Psalms. There's a bunch of psalm readings. Psalm 124, 8, the votum. Um, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then there's the confitior and the misereator of celebrant to ministers. And at that point, the minister strikes his breast three times when he says, mea culpa, mea culpa, um, mea maxa culpa. He strikes his breast three times. Um, That happens from the celebrant to the minister's and the ministers to the celebrants. Then there's the versicles and responses from the Psalms. Then there's the collect, which would be a short prayer, two short prayers. Then there's the blessing of the incense and the sensing of the altar and the ministers. So there would be all incense that would come in and be spread through the sanctuary and then spread upon the, the the priests doing their work. And then they would... They would secretly sing, the choir sang the Gloria in Excelsis, and the ministers sang it secretly, under their breath, behind the rude screen, hidden off. So the choir would sing that, they would do this, and then, and then there was the salutation and collects of the day, after which the celebrant says the epistle, and gradual, silently, so he's mumbling these things under his breath. There's a lot of mumbling going on. You have to remember that because the reformers constantly talk about the mumbling of the mass. Can't be understood. It's inscrutable. You don't know what's going on. No one knows what's going on, and it's meant to be mysterious until, boom, when it would make sense. Then the epistle is sung by a subdeacon. There's a response of the Deo gratias, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. That's what they say. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We do that. We give thanks for the word of the Lord. There's a gradual sung by the choir. There's a tractor sequence sung by the choir while our said prayers in preparation for the gospel. The Munda Cormeum, the Jubi Domine Benedici, Benedicere, the Dominus Seat in Corde Tuo, And then there's a salutation, an announcement of the gospel by the celebrant. The ministers then response, glory to you, Lord. The gospel is recited in a low tone. So there's a scripture reading low tones. The response by the ministers, praise be to Christ. The same repeated except for the celebrant's blessing added by a deacon. The gospel with lights and incense are now sung by a deacon. and Not like our deacons, Don't, don't worry deacons. And responses sung by ministers. And then finally, after all of that, the preacher goes to the pulpit. And he does his intimations, whatever that means, bidding prayers. An epistle and gospel are read in vernacular, not in Latin. 
whatever the, the common language was. And then there was a sermon followed by the Nicene Creed, sung as the Gloria in Excelsis. And everybody um, bows at and was made man. Everybody was to bow when you're singing the Nicene Creed at and, and he was made man. Was bowing. And then there's a salutation, a bidding uh, to prayer, but no prayer. So which, that's, I, I've got so much to go through, I just can't take questions right now. Um, but save it, because we're going to have a Q&A. Um, that's the liturgy of the Word. That is not even the liturgy of the upper room, which is even more complicated than that. Right? That, that's, there's a separate liturgy for the, the upper room. It's a bunch of psalms. It's a, it's a bunch of different um, motions and actions. It's a washing of, the, of the, the... The celebrant is the priest who is actually consecrating the bread. And he has to wash his hands in front of everybody um, while he's reciting uh, something. His hands are washed. And then... There are things he says inaudibly. There are things he says audibly. There's um, the Sursum Corda is sung, the Lord be with you and also with your spirit. We lift up our hearts. We lift up our hearts to the Lord. You've probably been in Protestant services that do that. Um, And then the whole prayer of consecration. The preface and the proper preface are sung by the celebrant. The sanctus, the benedictus, are then said audibly. The sanctus is then sung by a choir while the celebrant proceeds with the canon, said silently except for raising his voice at nobis quoquo. Bells are then rung to announce the beginning. And then there's the elevation with bells and incense at the word of institution and the singing of the benedictus qui venit. And then the canon closes with ekphonesis. I have no idea. Um, Somebody who knows Latin could probably help with what that means. Um, Then the Lord's Prayer is sung by the priest. And then the pox and the faction and the commixture happen. And then the Agnus Dei is said by the celebrant. Then it's sung by the choir. He strikes his chest three times during that uh, part with the, the mea culpa. The celebrant's communion. Then the celebrant himself takes communion. Okay, He himself does it. He goes through the collects, the kiss of peace to the clergy, the Domini Jesu Christe Fili Dei Vivi. And all these other things, he strikes his chest at that domine non sum dignus, which he says audibly. He receives the bread, saying the words of delivery. He gives thanks, citing a psalm. He receives the cup, saying the words of delivery. The communion of the people then happens in one kind, right? They don't get bread and wine. They get one kind. And they get... um, uh, with Echi Agnus Dei, the words of delivery come, and then there's the communion psalm sung by the choir. There's the cleansing of the chalice. So afterwards, the priest has to actually remove every bit of the blood of Christ and every bit of the, the body of Christ. So he cleans out the chalice at the end of it. He um, and then uh, covers the chalice, puts it back in its um, its chalice. Uh, chassis. And then, um, and then there's the salutation and post-communion collects. There are more prayers. The deacons, deacons do the salutation and dismissal of the people. And then there's the blessing of the people, right? The benediction is given. And uh, finally, it closes with John 1, 1 through 14, and the response, thanks be to God at the reading of the word. Okay, so it's remarkably complicated. It is, it is all over the place. It is half mumbled. It's half spoken loudly. 
It's, it's done behind a screen for the most part, so all of this is not making much sense to the people who are there, but it's all for the dramatic effect of the elevation of the bread, which is about the only thing the people who came can see, right? It's all they can see. Otherwise, it's just this mystery, this jumble of things they may, have, may, may or may not have heard and some, some music and, and some prayers and some scripture reading and, and other things. And so, um, now, now let's, so let's walk from, from Paris in the Notre Dame and let's walk into St. Peter's Cathedral in Geneva in 1555, same year, right? Um, 1555, you walk into St. Peter's in Geneva, the crucifixes are all removed. The statues of saints are gone. The relics are all put away or destroyed or sold, more likely sold. They wanted the money for those relics and they knew people would be willing to buy them. Um, The rude screen is gone. The altar is gone is gone. The interior walls and the pillars of the church are whitewashed to cover all all of the Catholic iconography. They whitewashed all the walls within St. Peter's, which was a Roman Catholic cathedral at one point. So they whitewashed them all. The stained glass windows are broken out. They're demolished. And that caused some problems. They did not replace them with clear windows. They just left them open. They broke them out, left them open, and the birds would go in and out during the services. It let the birds in. In 1577, the city council ordered that netting be put up to keep those birds out. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, for 20, for over 20 years, it's, they're just broken stained glass windows open to the elements. Winter, summer, whatever, hot, cold. The organ was now collecting dust and was not used. The organ. Finally, finally, the pipes were melted down and used to make plates for the hospital and communion vessels for the church. So they took the, the pipes of the pipe organ and melted them all down and made them into plates for use at the hospital. Um. Manich records a description of the services in Geneva put down with pen on paper by an unsympathetic attender of one of these services in 1555, a man named Antoine Catalan. Here's what he says. It is altogether like the interior, he's describing the sanctuary, it is altogether like the interior of a college or school full of benches and a, with a pulpit in the middle for the preacher. And in front of the pulpit, there are benches for women and small children, and around them raised up, the men are seated, without any distinction of personal rank. The stained glass windows are, all, are just all about knocked out, and the plaster dust is up to the ankles. Um, and then he says this about the service, and immediately the townspeople entered the church, Now contrast this with the Roman Catholic Mass. Immediately the townspeople entered the church, each person choosing his place to sit, as in school, and then they waited for the preacher to come to the pulpit. And immediately when the preacher appeared, all the people knelt down except the preacher, and he began praying with uncovered head and his hands joined. His prayer was entirely in French, created out of his own imagination, which concluded with the Lord's Prayer, but not the Ave Maria. Then all the people responded quietly, Amen. And two times a week, they sang a psalm before the sermon, but only in the cities. Everyone sings together while seated, men, women, girls, and he says, even infants. And if anyone recites a prayer on entering the church, He is pointed to and mocked and held to be a papist and idolater. (laughs) In other words, if anybody comes into the church and is, you know, doing that and saying a prayer as if entering into a 
the temple, he, uh, they were mocked. <laughs> so, so this guy who is not sympathetic says, okay, I think more likely that they were taken aside and corrected. And so now the liturgy of the church in Geneva during Calvin's time was, as you know, infinitely simpler than the Catholic Mass that we just walked through. And that is one of the principles of Reformed worship, is simplicity. In fact, if you boil down our worship, if you go through our worship, you basically have um, word and prayer and sacrament. It's word, prayer, and sacrament. I mean, really, if you go through all the elements, you have just a couple. We read the word, the call to worship, right? We pray, we lift up prayers. Uh, the preaching of the word is the word, right? The, the sacraments are the sacraments. But outside of that, what else is there? The benediction is the word of God. If we did an opening uh, salutation, that would be the word of God. If we did the votum, it's the word of God. I mean, it's all word of God. You get a lot of the word of God in our worship services, okay? We read three, three scripture readings in the middle of the service. So it's word, it's prayer, and music is prayer. When we sing, we're praying to God. And so even the music is prayer. It's not even a separate element. It's word and prayer and sacrament. That's the simplicity of our worship. We're not cleaning out bowls, right? We're not lifting things in the air. We're not, we're not uh, mumbling under our breaths so it can't be heard. We're not hiding things behind a screen where we have no reason to ever put up that screen. That's a violation of the regular principle of worship, to have a rude screen, right? Where are we ever commanded to, to not worship together? And the biggest factor is you would be participating. You would be, the whole purpose of it is for God's people to join together and join their voices in prayer and song. And so you would not be just observing a mystery and an act, you are participating in worship. It's a huge difference, okay? So, so how did, how, what was the liturgy in, in Calvin's Geneva, 1555, let's say? They started with the votum. Again, that's in the Roman Catholic liturgy. They didn't get rid of everything that's in the Roman Catholic liturgy. A lot of what we do is, was there. It's all the other superfluous stuff. The votum is Psalm 124.8. They started their services with that. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You guys have been in Protestant churches where they start the worship like that. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Okay. After that, they went to an exhortation, and that was an exhortation to confess your sins. So they would exhort the people to confess their sins. Then they would do a prayer of confession, the, uh, a confession of sin. And then they would do a prayer for pardon. Uh, at that point. In fact, even early on in Calvin's liturgy it's, litur liturgy, it's called an absolution, where the pastor is absolving the, the people of their sins. That's a little too close to Rome for me. And so what we do when we confess our sins is we then will read God's word to you, which assures you of his forgiveness, right? Rather than an absolution, it's a... It's a um, a reminder, it's a scripture reminder of God's forgiveness. He is the only one who forgives sins. So they would do a prayer of pardon, then they would do a metrical psalm, sung congregationally. They would do a psalm set to meter, and uh, Calvin commissioned new works for those psalms. He, um, everybody referred to them as the Genevan Jigs. Uh, it was contemporary music. So Calvin was a practitioner of contemporary Christian music. He, um, he, he commissioned uh, Claude Goudemel to set the psalms to music, and so they predominantly sang psalms. They were not exclusive psalmody, in, in Geneva at least. They also sang the Ten Commandments like uh, we often do. They also sang the the uh, song of Simeon, like we will today, and they sang it after the Lord's table, as we will do. Um, they sang uh, 
the Lord's Prayer also, so not exclusive psalmody. Um, after the metrical psalm, they would do a prayer of illumination before the sermon, so the prayer before the sermon. Then they would have the scripture reading of the sermon text. Then there would be the sermon. Following that would be a pastoral prayer that would end with a congregational recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Following that, there would be a prayer of preparation for the Lord's table. Following that, there would be the Apostles' Creed, which they sung congregationally. Ha ha, not even scripture. They're singing songs that are not even scripture. Um, I'm just trying to stick it to the exclusive psalmody guys a little bit. Um, and then you would have the words of institution, you would have the fencing of the table, you would have the distribution, usually with people processing forward to, to receive the meal as they come uh, up the aisles to the front. And then they would sing a psalm or they would have some scripture read while the elements are being dis distributed. They would sing or hear scripture read. And then that would, they would partake of the elements. There would be a prayer of thanksgiving. There would be the Aaronic blessing, the benediction, and that was the service. That service is very close or should feel very close to what we do in our worship service because we've sort of based our worship service off of that reformed and Genevan and Calvinistic heritage. Now, we've moved things around a bit. Um, but if you go through, there are books that lay out liturgies. And so you could go look at Luther's liturgy, which was like, it was the mass with a few tweaks. I mean, it was, it needed reform, for sure. Luther, Luther didn't get there. But you can go look at Eclampadius's, you can go look at the, the Reformed Church of Denmark, you can go look at the Reformed Churches of Strasbourg and Bootser and all the, so you, they're all working on their liturgies, right, at this time. And you can compare and contrast them. They're basically the same as Geneva's, but just with stuff moved around. But simple. Yeah. Uh, no. No, not in Geneva. Um, there, they, um, the magistrates had a little bit too much meddling going on with the worship in Geneva, and so um, they ended up celebrating it quarterly. But Calvin wanted it more frequently, um, certainly more frequently, and so that was a compromise that he made with the, the over meddling city magistrates. All right, um, so you see the remarkable difference between the liturgy of the, the Reformed and the liturgy of the Roman Catholic, right? And so that's the first answer to why do we do what we do? Well, um, the regular principle and our historical understanding and how those things fall out and our historical connection to the uh, Reformers. Um, the, but the Reformers you see, we're committed to simplicity. It doesn't take any work at all to find them writing about simplicity or a return to apostolic simplicity in their worship and church order, right? Acts 2, 42, the apostles teaching fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. That's how they describe their assemblies very simply. And so add to their simple liturgy the obvious change in the clerical clothing. Remember, there's no more stoles, there's no, there's no more flashiness that way. What the Genevan um, pastors wore, and this was traditional amongst uh, many until the Anglicans went crypto-Catholic, um, they wore black academic gowns. They wore the gowns of scholars, just black. You know, simple black um, gowns. And... Uh, so they rejected all the vestments. They rejected all of that. Um, there would, you know, in the English Reformation, there were some difficulties over those things with the Puritans and the Anglicans, but um, skip that for now. Um, they wore simple academic gowns. They announced to the people that the pastors were there to teach them. That's why they wore those gowns. 
not to, not to do their sacerdotal magic tricks. They were just there to teach them. That's why they wore the, the, the gowns of the, the academics. Um, they were there to appeal to their understanding. They were there not to perform some mystical drama set off from the layman for their observation. Um, they were not committed to simplicity just for simplicity's sake. They believed that simplicity was the result of regulating our worship by Scripture. Okay, that would be the end result. And that simplicity would lead to then understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's the principle. Simplicity leads to understanding, and understanding in worship is key. Calvin makes that point, and at the beginning, he wrote a preface to the Genevan Psalter that they published. Now listen to what he says. For our Lord did not institute the order which we observe when we convene in his name solely to amuse the world by seeing and looking at it. By seeing and looking at it, right? He's, he's talking about the whole spectacle of Roman worship. He didn't institute it so that we would just look and see on it. Rather, however, he wished that profit would come from it to all his people. As St. Paul witnesses, commanding that all which is done in the church be directed toward the common edification of all. This the servant would not have commanded had it not been the intention of the master. But this cannot be done unless we are instructed to have intelligence of all that has been ordained for our profit. Because to say that we are able to have devotion, either at prayers or ceremonies, without understanding anything of them, is a great mockery, however much it is commonly said. This is a thing neither dead nor brutish, this good affection toward God. Rather, it is a lively movement proceeding from the Holy Spirit when the heart is properly touched, the heart is properly touched, and the understanding is enlightened, right? So he's aiming for the heart and the mind in the worship, that the church and her people would be engaged in ascribing to God the glory due his name. And that involves your affections first and your mind informed by your infection, affection, infections your mind informed by your affections, okay? And so that was the aim, that all would come together and lift up proper praises to God. He writes this about music later in that preface to the Genevan Psalter. It is necessary to remember that which St. Paul has said, the spiritual songs cannot be well sung save from the heart. But the heart requires the intelligence. And in that, says St. Augustine, lies the difference between the singing of men and that of birds. For a linnet, a nightingale, a parrot may, may sing well, but it will be without understanding. But the unique gift of man is to sing knowing that which he sings. After the intelligence must follow the heart and the affections, a thing which is unable to be except if we have the hymn imprinted on our memory in order never to cease from singing. Okay, so, um, I mean, I'm just trying to go right to the base level on all these things. Why do we do what we do in worship? Well, the reason you participate has a great history. And for a long time, you, you would not have been able to participate in worship. To make any voice any sound would have been, been deemed sacrilegious, an interruption to the mystery unfolding before you, right? That is, that is uh, it's almost inconceivable um, for us. How many of you grew up Roman Catholic? How many of you feel the pain in this? It's changed. I mean, it's not, it's not like the the. Ro the the medieval time. You know, I don't think you'll see rude screens unless you go to a, a Roman Catholic parish that is, is using the Latin Mass and is trying to go back to the, back to the future. I don't know. But yeah, so it's very complicated. It's very non-participatory. They've changed since, I mean, Trent changed things. Vatican II changed things. 
and made it much probably more participatory, certainly um, as they cast a longing eye at the Protestant church. <laughs> um, did I see a question now? Uh, Bob, I'll come back to you. Um, is it a short, short one or a long one? Okay. Great. No. That's right. Except for a few of the scripture readings. That's right. It was mainly Latin, sung in Latin, and the expectation was they were not participants. They were observants. Yeah. Yes. They, uh, which element was it? The bread. They only got the bread. They couldn't trust the people not to spill the wine, which was the blood of Christ, and they did not want to take that chance. And so they withheld it from, from the people. There are probably other concocted theological reasons for that, but I really think there was a fearfulness about it being desecrated that motivated that, and it was just easier to, to place the bread in the mouth and not risk spillage. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do with with the crumbs that fall. What do you do with that? They're very scrupulous about that. Um, Lutherans are very scrupulous about what you do with the elements too. They, if there's leftover wine, it's poured into the ground directly. They have separate sinks in their kitchens that go straight into the ground, and that's where they pour the extra wine. Um, from the, I don't know what Roman Catholics do with... That's right, the priest... Ha, yeah, the, yeah, the priest has to guzzle it. He has to finish it off. That's right. He can't leave any. And that happens in the service, and that's why he can clean out the chalice, because he's ingested all of it. And so they saw the priest ingest large quantities of wine, but they were not able to drink the blood of their Lord. Um, all right, we've got to stop. That's it for day one on worship. We'll, uh, we'll keep going from here. Father, thank you for... Your Son, thank you that we have your Word, and your Word tells us how to worship you. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in our worship. I pray now that you would be working in our minds and in our hearts, and that we would truly be filled with grace and joy and peace and comfort from your Word. Speak through your Word, through your servants. Work in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's table today. Nourish us here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.